Good evening. Welcome to a special edition of The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. We have a special show tonight with a man of many parts. Our guest has worked in public service for decades. At the high point of that was when he led Ghana's monetary efforts as governor of the Central Bank under President Rawlings. Later on, he also became Minister of Finance under President John Evans at Mills. He's a businessman and a statesman. Tonight we're picking his reflections on a lecture he gave recently on the Ghanaian dream, how to create sustainable jobs for the people of Ghana. We'll come and talk about that when we return. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight's guest is Dr. Kwabna Dufo. He's an economist. He's a banker. He's also a businessman and a statesman. We're talking to him on a wide variety of issues, particularly the economy of which he's much concerned about and job creation, which he considers the key objective of economic policy. Doc, thanks for joining us on The Point of View. Good evening. Good evening. It's not very often that you grant interviews, so we are grateful you've decided to talk to us. Thank you. And you don't also do too many public comments, but, but this week you, you gave a, almost an hour lecture on the economy of Ghana. Can you tell us why you decided to come out now to speak about the economy? Thank you very much. You know, I left office as the finance minister about nine years ago, uh, 12, uh, 2012. And as I mentioned today, at the time, unemployment was at its lowest, about 2.2%. The youth were not having a lot of challenges. They were all having jobs to do. For some years now, we've been worried about the issue of unemployment. As you mentioned, I'm a businessman. I have a lot of companies. And I experienced the young people coming to me most every day, all looking for jobs, graduates who have been out for five, six years, not having jobs to do. Incidentally, it has become a topical issue in Ghana now. Everyone is talking about it. Just last week, the World Bank spoke about it. Incidentally, in the budget for 2022, the whole thing was on job creation. So it means it's an issue that we as Guineans must confront it. So, so this is why you chose job creation, because the economy is vast. Why the job creation focus specifically? The economy is bad, maybe, but the job creation and the youth un unemployment is bigger than anything. When you have the youth who have no jobs to do, it's scary. They have no future. If they have no future, it means the country has no future. So to me, the youth unemployment means more to me than even the economy you're talking about. They are the economy. They are the future of the nation. You understand? Mm. So it meant so much to me. The theme was interesting. The Ghanaian dream. It sounded like um, something Obama or somebody would say. It sounds like some introduction to some bigger without a political something because the Ghanaian dream and then the unemployment and died can you just tell us a bit about why you chose that topic and why the Ghanaian dream we all dream don't we we dream for good things what are Ghanaian youth dreaming about now we hear of these young people looking for visas to travel why they're not happy here we don't see the future here, but we have so much. The reason why they are leaving is that they don't see opportunities for them. No opportunities. But if we had opportunities for everybody, no matter your background, you went to university, had a first class in economics, now you do media. You had a huge opportunity. I'm talking about equal opportunities for all Guineans. If we all had that, Everybody could achieve anything he wanted to achieve, could get to any level. Whether your father was a carpenter, or a professor, a prof or a farmer. It's not important, because you, the ground is level for everybody. And therefore, you could get to any level that you want to get to. The real dream is, an environment 
where every Guinean will have same opportunity, equal opportunity, a level playing field to get to where you want to get to, no matter your background. And I, you have about four dimensions to you. You are an economist, you are a banker and a finance person, you are also a business entrepreneur, and of course you serve on many boards. I noticed you, you spent a lot of time discussing things from the economist perspective. Is that because that's your first field? Why, why was economics so much laced in the presentation? I'm a trained economist. Mm -hmm. And I lectured economics for 11 years at the university. Why else I was doing my banking? So naturally, I'll be talking more about economics than in the profession. I became a businessman later, but I've been groomed as an economist. I've worked as an economist, a banker, and a lecturer. So obviously, I'll be talking more about economics. So even though you run many institutions in insurance, finance, and you're a finance minister, your econ you, you, you interpret the economy through an economist's perspective. That's your frame of reference. That's correct. The, the other thing I noticed was you, you, you seem to spend a lot more time talking about 2009 to 2013 than you, even, you did bef prior or before. Because I know you were governor as well. And governor, you were deputy governor, and then you became governor 97 to 2001. Then you became finance minister 09 to early 2013. Why the special emphasis on the Mills period during the lecture? I want to believe that some of you don't even remember when I was a governor. 99, where were you? You don't even remember. And we have to tell our story now. I worked with Dr. Mills, he's no more. We are talking about the state of the economy now. There are two major political parties. You will hear, oh, the NDC destroyed the whole economy. They did so badly. I will be unfair to Atta Mills if I should sit down quietly and not put his case to the people. That for four years, almost four years that he served as our president, this is what he was able to do for the nation. That's why today I stressed on his performance, that for the period, this is what he was able to do for Ghana. That's all. I noticed you spoke about low inflation, so apparently there were 31 straight months of single digit inflation. Yes. You spoke about exchange rate stability and that within that period, only 10% annual depreciation of CD against the dollar. And then you spoke about growth. Let, let's deal with in inflation briefly. Why is single digit inflation such an important issue to economists? Because some people say, it be inflation, we go chop. Why do economists always tout single digit or low inflation as something to pursue? Inflation is so critical in managing an economy. Inflation, if it's not controlled properly, can destroy everything. Inflation, if you don't control it, will destroy pensioners whose incomes are fixed, will destroy businesses which are on the margin, Destroy almost everything. Why? Because it affects the cost of living. For example, as I mentioned today, if you're unable to manage your currency properly, it feeds into inflation. Prices will be rising. And if your incomes are not rising and your price, price are rising, what's the meaning? You are worse off. You are becoming poorer and poorer and poorer. So, inflation is a very serious thing that. Politicians, policymakers, must all look at seriously. I've, I don't disagree with inflation, but I've heard some economists argue that the inflation targeting framework that we use in our macro management mm. is not necessarily beneficial. I've even heard some say we should target job creation. So I've heard an economist argue, I think one of the Legon economist says we should do employment targeting, not inflation targeting. I don't know what you make of that whole debate because they feel 
sometimes when you focus too much on inflation, you tend to be too cautious. And you, what you need for an economy, for example, a post-COVID economy, is to stimulate it. And if you are too worried about inflation, and this is from the governor's perspective, you dampen economic activity. So uh, what, what's your reflection on that, that discussion? You see, they are confusing spending and expenditure. If you are spending and you're spending well, mm -hmm. it will not lead to inflation. Inflation is bad. And it will show that, yes, your spending is bad. For example, during the COVID, mm -hmm. nations spent so much. How many of them experienced higher inflation? It means the spending was good. A good spending will not lead to inflation. So the focus should not be on just inflation, but the spending. How is the spending being done? If the spending is leading to inflation, it means your spending is bad. So those who argue like that, they are confusing spending and inflation. And expenditure. And expenditure. Spending and expenditure. Yes, yeah, spending and expenditure. If your expenditure, your spending is good, there will be no inflation. But to the extent that your spending is leading to inflationary pressures, it's not good spending. So what is good spending and what is bad spending then? The bad spending is the one what, that will lead to inflationary pressures. It will, it's making us lose our purchasing power. If the spending is leading to a situation where we are losing our spending power, then it's a bad spending, bad expenditure. But if it's not, then it's good spending. And by doing that, you are creating jobs. The people are working. They're producing goods and services. It's not leading to inflation. It's good spending. Mm. Understand? Let's talk about growth. The other point you made in your analysis was the 2009 to 2013 growth. Again, you argued that you had the highest level of sustained growth of any government. Some people think that oil had a lot to do with that, but you, you, you sort of disaggregated and said no. Can you elaborate? Because from, from the numbers we see, it was the 2011 oil growth of 14% that propped up the Mills era. No, they should look at 2010. What was the GDP growth in 2010? Have they looked at it? It's seven plus, almost eight, 2010. There was no oil injection. The first oil money came in January 2011. Once again, this aggregate, the 14.5, take oil from the figure so that you have non-oil and oil. Yes, we had oil production. We had oil revenue in 2011. So it boosted the growth. But it was not oil that drew the economy in 2011, and not oil. Take it out. And you see that with that oil, 2011 mm, had a very high economic growth, which means we were able to impact on the real success of the economy not oil. And look at 2012, what happened? 2013, what happened? 2013, we had about 7.3, 7.4 growth rate. You take the oil out. So the non-oil sector of the economy from 2010, 2011, 2012 grew very much because of firm fiscal and monetary policies. What was the effect of that on job creation? Again, we've read some economists argue that the, they call it the employment elasticity of the growth was very low, so that for a percentage of growth, what level of employment does it create? They, they felt that if you look at our job creation numbers within even that good period of growth, it wasn't that much. 
partly because they felt that the sources of growth were not inclusive or diverse enough. Where you have said we shouldn't use just oil, but some of the sectors that even mining, they are enclave sectors. So you may grow because you produce a lot more gold or a lot more oil and you get revenue from it. But if you look at the number of people employed in the sector, it's very low. What's your, your comment? No, let them do sectoral analysis during that period. The growth that we're talking about came from which sectors? We have the agri sector, the cyber sector, industrial sector. Quick of the sectors registered the highest growth. 2011, the industrial sector, including the oil, registered a very high growth. 2012, it went down because the plateau had been established, you see, by 2012. The oil effect came down. And therefore, the growth in 2012 came from mainly the real sector or the real sectors of the economy. The figures are there. I'm happy you've raised this issue because my colleagues, economists at the IFS, but a year ago, we argued like that. But this year, what she came to be say, Fanda, you are right. Oil did not make a huge impact as we all thought. The figures are there. And I'm saying that the growth of the economy from 2010, not 2011, 2010, was a result of the fair monetary and fiscal policies. We're able to achieve stability. When you have control over your currency, currency affects everything. If you're not able to manage your currency properly, as we explained today, between 2006 and 2019, mm -hmm. the city's instability, city depreciation, affected our public debt by about 30%. Because if I borrow so much in dollars and your currency is depreciating, you make payments from cities, isn't it? So about 30% of the public data to see, the growth of that 30% was due to currency depreciation. Final point on currency depreciation, whilst we are in this area. So some argue that the reason our currency keeps depreciation, in fact, if you look at the time series of the CD against the dollar without redenomination, the CD keeps falling. It's a continuous fall against the major trade partners, even though the rate of fall varies. They say these are structural issues. We import too much. So if the performance between 2009 and 2012 was that great, the direction of the fall of the CD was still the same, even though the rate may have been lower. No. Did you read Dr. Abbey's comment? When? Which comment? Dr. J Joe Abbey. Abbey. When, when, what comment was that? When the, the speech I gave today, his uh, speech he made at the Rotary Club. What did he say? On the currency, the 98. Hmm? The city appreciation was less than 5%. Why? How come? That, that particular year, mm. the depreciation was less than 5%. But it depreciated nonetheless. That's my argument. My, my argument is not that the CD doesn't depreciate. My argument is that the CD is on a continual trend of depreciation. It's the rate that varies. No, it means you, there's something wrong with the economy. A currency is not supposed to be depreciating like that. Do all currencies depreciate like that? Have you been looking at major currencies? So that's what I'm asking you. Is, so that, the way, is that the way they depreciate? So, so the question, why? why? Why has it never appreciated consistently for a year? Why does it always depreciate? Depreciate. Yes, it always does. Just that the rate changes. So you're saying under your tenure, the rate was lower, so, but it's still depreciated. Yes, because we are trading with other, currents, other nations. So your inflationary pressures here, as compared to U.S., will impact on your currency. But if we achieve lower inflation, as we did in 
through 2012. You have a, that advantage, you understand? But one of you have a weaker currency, you are at a disadvantage. In 2009, by the end of the year, Ghana's currency had become the best currency for trading in all imaginations. Did you know that? You didn't. 2009? Yes, before end of the year. Because of the carry trade. The best currency for trading. So, the, 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 I guess that the reason I keep pressing on the currency issue is two, two things. It's become one of the biggest subjects of discussion. You know Dr. Baumi has run many lectures on the currency depreciation. And I think the NDC from 2013 started facing problems. Now, we've also been told that the reason the currency depreciates is the structure of the economy is too import dependent. So I guess the reason I keep pressing this point is what structural things did you do to show that the behavior of the currency under your tenure was much better than other governments before and after? You see, today I talked about the fiscal space, meaning the revenue we mobilize and the expenditure we make. The difference impacts on your currency. If you spend more than you mobilize, there will pressure on your currency. You understand? And if I have read Dr. Abbey's contribution, he was emphasizing on the firmness of, of the team in 1998. The fact that we were very firm on spending, very firm on the monetary. When you're able to do that, you have a strong currency. You see, currency affects everything in society. A strong currency means a strong central bank. The argument that, oh, we have a structural issue, therefore currency should slide or depreciate, I don't buy that. It means you are losing control of the economy. I'm not saying it's easy, but you should try as much as possible to to control your currency. Listening to you carefully today, the assumption is that something went wrong when Mills left office. You need to elaborate on that because the records you gave were 2009 to 2012 or early 2013. It seems as if indirectly you seem to be saying that when the Mills team left office, things became difficult or things went south. What, what are you really trying to say, if you can explain? I would like to conclude that because I was not part of the team. I wouldn't know exactly what happened. No. But what's your observation about the, the nature of economic management? Once again, you see, management is a science. And indeed, it's a situational science. Hmm? Situation in the sense that it depends on who is managing what and where the person is coming from. If we give uh, recipes to two women to prepare soup, the taste will be different. The same recipes, but the taste depending on how the two women manage <laughs> the combined the various recipes, isn't it? I will not be able to explain what happened after I left the office. No. I can talk about my period and what I did. This is the point of view. We're talking to Dr. Kwamna Dufour. He is a former governor of the Central Bank, former minister of finance. He's also a businessman. And um, he gave a lecture earlier today on the Ghanaian dream and how to create jobs. We're quizzing him about his economic ideas and why he feels strongly about some of the issues he raised. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight we're talking to Dr. Kwamnat Dufo, former governor of the Bank of Ghana. Indeed, he was deputy governor, he became governor, and then he, he later on under President Mills became minister of finance. And of course, he's a businessman, holder holdings, he's into real estate, he's into agriculture, he's into media, and in banking. Uh, Doc, so you, 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 you worked with Rawlings. Yes, I did. Um, you were deputy governor and also governor. The little we know is that you were at GCB, you had gone to work in the London 
uh, international Ghana International Bank set it up. Ghana Commercial Ghana Bank, Commercial Bank London set it up. Just what was it like working as a governor under the Rawlings uh, government in the, the mid to late 90s? You want to know the truth? I enjoyed working with him. I found him to be an amazing leader. For the period I worked with the Rawlings, I enjoyed my work. What was it about Rawlings that made he, working with him so enjoyable? No, I think he believed in me. When he asked me about how I was going to manage the government accounts at the central bank, and I told him that as a banker, this is the way I say it. As a president, in banking, this is what we do. If you do not have money in your account and you draw your check, it must be balanced. But for government, even if you don't have money and you want to draw a check, you must make accommodation for it. Government must run. You cannot stop government from running. He asked me to explain. I said, if you don't have money, government, and you want money, you must make accommodation, meaning apply for an overdraft. It will be given. But if you don't have money, and you do not want to apply for an overdraft, and you bring the check, I will bounce it. He asked me why? I said, because the money is yours. Apply for it. Why are you saying no? So, is that the case? Please, yes, sir. Three times, really? Yes, sir. So that's all that you need to say. Yes, sir. If you apply for the draft, when you have money, you should be given money to run the government. They understood me. After that encounter, I had no problem for the period I stayed at the central bank. You are, you are suggesting that independence of the central bank was not an issue even with a man who used to be a military dictator, because I, I central bank governors, the issue of independence is the most critical. I had complete independence under Rollins. I don't remember a day he asked me to be given a password for government. No. I tell people, total independence under Rollins. They don't read Dr. B's portion. I could stop check payment because I didn't have enough money, and he would understand me. Did you have clashes with finance? Because we know that sometimes when monetary central bank makes certain moves, finance may not be happy, and they, they clash. Under your tenure, I think it was Kwame Pepra who was finance minister, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think I had any clashes with him. But he was a finance minister. He was his contractors to be paid, naturally. Mm -hmm. And I don't have funds to do that. So Kwame, wait f for a week for me to get my funds in. He wouldn't be happy so, because there will be pressure on him. I've been there before. Finance ministers are always under pressure from those people. But I never had any issues with him. So in terms of, for example, in cabinet, we've heard of the Ahoys. We've heard of the Ibn Chambasis and the Spio Gabres. You, you, you are saying your time with Rollins was the best time. Working with him, you enjoyed the most. So I wanted to know who within this team you worked with and how that relationship was. Maybe because Jerry was so much <laughs> behind me, <laughs> nobody was, would give me any problems. I don't remember anybody giving me, no. I don't remember. We worked together. I was supporting to him direct, you understand? So I had no difficulty. Do you think the role of central bank governor has changed? I'm asking because after the Kufour administration, almost at least if you look at the people who've been running mates for some of the more recent candidates, they've all been governors. So you have uh, Amy Sartha, and then you have Dr. Baumi as well. It seems to have become a preparatory ground for some sort of presidential role. What, what do you make of that situation? 
Well, I mean, if uh, you need monetary and fiscal to run a good economy, and you are the president, and you have somebody who has some expertise in the monetary to help you, it should be okay. You understand? Because he will support the finance minister, who will be handling the fiscal. The deputy uh, governor has been handling the monetary. He's now the vice president. He will, all things being equal, he'll be supporting the finance minister, who is now handling the fiscal. And you have a better not room, no, economic management. The vice president is considered generally the head of the economic management team. Is that something that was manifesting itself within your time in the 90s to the early 2000s? Because these days, we are told the vice president is the head of EMT. So that when they have conversations, the vice president is, takes the lead. When you were governor or finance minister, was that the situation as well? Yeah, Prof Mills was the head of the, the management team when I was the governor. He was, yeah. But when you were finance minister, was the vice president the head of EMT? He was. So that's, that would be President Mahama? Yes. You wish him happy birthday today. What's your relationship with him like? No, he, He's my friend. We work together. Do you plan to compete, contest him for the flag bearership? There's no contesting. <laughs> if people are looking for position, it's not, it's not competition. It's not contesting. You are fighting for a position. I'm, I will not say competing. No. Are you offering yourself for flag bearer for NDC? We have not got there yet. Is there pressure on you? Are people advising you to do it? No. Are you thinking about it? Yes. How long have you been thinking about it? How long? Thinking about it. That's a dual question. How long? What I mean is, has it been something you've been thinking for a year or six months or a week? No, I mean, people who had influence had, at the point in time, asked me to run. And I didn't do it. So this will not be the first time? No. This will not be the first no. time? No. But is the NDC in a good shape? I've seen a few adverts of yours asking people to join the NDC. In fact, on this show, that advert was played where you, you asked people to sub rally and support the NDC. What do you think the, where do you think the NDC is as a, a political force in Ghana today? It's a big political party, a very strong one. But like all political parties, you have to sensitize the members, let them understand where we are going. So that video was aimed at encouraging them to come together to build a formidable party. But it's a strong party. There's nothing wrong with the NDC that we cannot write if we come together. There's no problem. What do you make of the party's performance in 2020 election? Presidential what? parliamentary. The parliament is almost divided and they call it a hung parliament. What, what did you make of the party's performance at the election? They did well. They did well. You think so? Yeah. They did well. I mean, if you are referring to parliamentary arrangement as a hung parliament. It means they did well. You don't think so? I'm just asking. They did well. It was good. What do you think of the performance of the current parliamentarians? As we speak, the budget has not gone through. There is some sort of um, standoff. Do you follow the, the work of the parliamentary caucus? What do you make of how they are conducting themselves? That's democracy. They should argue. 
the two parties should continue to struggle. Each one tried to put his case across. And in the end, the victor will have the day. I know there's nothing wrong with this budget. In the end, they will have it will come out. Because between now and end of the year, they have to get to the appropriation bill, get all the figures sorted out, and then pass the appropriation bill into act for us to have something to spend come January 1st. So it will be okay. It's a democracy. That's what happens in all nations. I don't see any difficulty here. No. It will be okay. But on the budget itself, today you made a point about the e-levy, and you were suggesting that it, would, it could result in a double tax. Can you explain that? Mode of payment. What's the meaning? I'm transferring something to you. Can it should it be taxed? What's the underlying transaction? Okay. So my argument was that. Yes. We need so much revenue. So we have to widen the net. I agree with the finance minister. But if there are other areas where money can be mobilized easily, we should look at it. Especially if we can get the money in the <laughs> big volume like the extractive industry. We should look at it. It should, it should be easier. That's all. I think he's trying to get over 6 billion CDs from the e-levy. Yeah. Um, is where can he get that type of money within the period that we're in? The extractive industry, we can get it. We can. Because you look at the minerals, for example. Look at uh, Botswana, the way they are managing the minerals industry. Look at the oil industry. We should still now partner with them and we'll be able to overcome all these challenges. I believe that. This is still the point of view. We're talking to Dr. Kwabna Dufour, who earlier today gave a lecture on the economy and on job creation. He touched on some interesting ideas around the green economy. He also touched on agriculture and agro-processing, and he spent a few minutes talking about revenue mobilization. You seem quite enamored by recycling. And you actually even pointed to a young man who was converting, was it coconut into charcoal? Coconut husk. Into charcoal. Into charcoal, yeah. Just here, I do do well. Why your fascination with recycling? Because of the advantage in that. It will help clean the environment, the filth we are in. Look at the coconut husk scattered throughout the city. Apart from the fact that he's clearing them for us to have a good environment, he's recycling this into money, giving jobs to people. So it's not only the money aspect, but the environmental issues is helping us resolve. So green jobs not only gives you job and revenue, gives you a healthier environment. That is the beauty of it. You understand? And you also spoke about cassava. Yeah. <laughs> what is it about cassava that makes you think it's such a, an important area for job creation? I talked about the uses even in the industrial sector. Pharmaceuticals, textiles, confessionally. You understand? The ethanol. And 2010, I was able to get the brewers to use cassava to brew beer. And we have beer made from cassava. If we are the second biggest producer of cassava in Africa, what can we do with it? 
because it has huge potential. And the industrial uses are so huge in Europe, everywhere. As I mentioned, Rwanda is exporting cassava leaves. Rwanda here. Whatever we can produce, consume, sell, it should be pursued. Why are we not making use of it? It's a God-given asset. We can grow cassava anywhere. We all eat cassava, don't we? Why are we not working at it? What's wrong with that? Hmm? Let's end this segment by talking about manufacturing. You said that construction was a, there was a huge infrastructure gap and that the government can use that to help to create jobs. What we tend to see is that a lot of the things that happen when the road sector are capital intensive. You are talking about job creation. How do you solve a problem like unemployment using infrastructure? Construction is infrastructure, isn't it? Construction employs so many workers, doesn't it? So, infrastructure can help to solve the unemployment problem. Roads. Assuming we decide to construct a road from here to Takrade. A motorway to Takrade, for example. How many workers would we need? Infrastructure can help us resolve some of the unemployment issues we have. You don't believe that? Sounds like an interesting idea. We'll take a short break. This is the point of view. We're talking to Dr. Kwabna Dufour. He gave a lecture earlier today on the Ghanaian dream. What is the Ghanaian dream? He spoke about job creation. We've been chatting about his economic ideas. We'll come back with a few final points. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. We're talking to Dr. Kwabna Dufour, who earlier today gave a speech under the auspices of the IFS, which he founded, Institute for Fiscal Studies. And he spent a lot of time talking about the economy and job creation, about the green economy, and macro stability, and all of those things. Um, he is a businessman as well, founder of the Hoda Holdings, and we'll talk about that briefly. Just a quick point. I noticed you were quite passionate about the interest rate issue. And then you said there were two types of banks. The bigger banks who seem to have a lot of cheap money and the smaller banks who have time deposits and they struggle. And then you felt that that whole equation there to be balanced for interest rates to come down. I was just wondering where Unibank played in that because in that your analysis, was Unibank a big bank or a small bank? And what do you th think of where the bank is right now? What happened to the bank? Unibank was a big bank. See, so the big banks have corporate accounts. Smaller banks usually have the SMEs and the individuals. So they tend to have more savings. The, the corporate banks, the big banks with corporate accounts, big companies, they tend to have huge current accounts. You understand? But the nature of those big banks and the customers they are managing, they tend to have big credit account balances. Unibank was a big one. And all those big banks, as I'm saying, have huge current account balances on which they pay virtually nothing. So they have advantage over the smaller ones who have SME accounts and individual accounts. They are the ones who have higher cost of funds because they don't have corporate accounts with huge balances in the current accounts but they're all in the same market okay so it's a structural problem which i think government will have to look at one day what do you feel about what happened to unibank well, it's in court. Mm -hmm. An issue in court usually 
shouldn't be talked about outside court. I want to believe that the issues will resolve pretty soon. It's been in the court since uh, 2018. How optimistic are you that I believe that there uh, will be a favor what is a favorable outcome for you? Favorable? What is a favorable outcome for you? What are you expecting from the procedures, from the processes? Well, once you have a case uh, with the arbitration, uh, arbitral judges, you'll get something out of that, won't you? My, what I'm asking is, are you hoping to get the license back or are you hoping that you will just be compensated? I wouldn't know the thinking of uh, the judges, but what I know is that uh, we are we pursuing the case and that the solution will come out very soon. But how much of a blow was that to you, what happened in 2018? It was a big blow, but I was lucky. The family was so behind me. Very painful experience, but I understood it. You've been a governor, you've been a finance minister. High-profile jobs, you will pay for that. So I paid heavily for it, but because of my family, I was able to handle it. How well are your other businesses doing? Because we know you have interest in media, insurance, real estate, agriculture. Well, some of them are affected by the Eurobank uh, issues, but others are doing well. They are still doing well. Are you enjoying your new position as a media owner? Very much so. Yeah. Which aspect of media do you enjoy? Is it radio, TV, or newspaper? Well, the newspaper was the first one I set up. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy the, uh, the radio and TV. Okay. Very well. Very much. Those of us in the media, we, we, we complain it's, it's a tough business. We lose a you, Well, you are in it, so yes, it's tough. Yes, it's, it's tough, and You're you lose outside. a lot of money. We enjoy it. You yeah. enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So it's not one of your most high profile, of all the interests you have, media that is not that capital intensive for you? It is. It is. most enjoyable. It's a very powerful professional, isn't it? You are the this fourth what? <laughs> Realm of, the, of, of what? <laughs> Tell me. We, we just ask questions. No, but uh, you occupy a very important position in the governance uh, system of, this, of every country, isn't it? So in your view, media's role is positive in an economy? Very positive. You're doing well. You are doing very well. The media is playing a very impactful role in our economy. You're doing well. I admire you. Thank you. Even if you're not making money, you are playing... A very useful role for all of us. Finally, today is the 29th of November and the whole country heard you speak. When next should we expect to hear from Dr. Komna Dufour on this scale? I'll let you know. <laughs> you, let let, you, know. you give me the first right of... I'll let you know, sure. You let me know. Thank I'll you for talking, let to, you know. thank you for talking to us. But thank you very much too. I've enjoyed uh, the interaction today. It went very well. Thank you. I'll let you know this time I want to speak. Fantastic. Yeah. We've been talking to Dr. Kwamnad before. He's an economist. He's a businessman. He's an entrepreneur. He's also, you can call him a statesman now. He's talking to us about a wide variety of issues. He gave a lecture on the economy today under IFS auspices. We discussed some of the ideas. We spoke about concerns and interest in him becoming flag bearer of NDC. And we also reflected briefly on some of his challenges in business. Hope you've enjoyed tonight's edition of the show. We'll see you next time. The Business Dashboard is next. Bye-bye.